Welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Robertson. As always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Robertson, as we're still battling through the last bit of this cold. So bear with me. I may have to pause every now and again. You know how it goes. But uh, but we soldier on, and the Bulldogs will take on Alabama tonight. As of this uh, recording, it is raining right now in Starkville. There is some rain in the forecast later today. But uh, as of this morning, there has been no movement yet as far as changing the start time of the game. A lot of people are messaging and asking about that so they can make, make plans to be here. We certainly understand that. But as of now, no change to the current schedule. we got an incredible meteorology department here at Mississippi State. And so, uh, so I trust them. And we rarely, rarely, rarely have a, uh, a change in schedule. You know, we did during Super Bulldog weekend. But, um, you know, it is what it is. So I just shared that with you right out of the gate. I'm trying to get to show up a little bit earlier today for those of you that are planning to travel. But, um, yeah, huge series uh, coming up between Mississippi State and Alabama. This Alabama team is a, is a good team. They're an improved team. And uh, I, I want to share, too, you had a chance to speak to Mark Etheridge earlier this week, and uh, I reach out to people that I know when I need information about teams that maybe I don't watch as often, and Alabama's one of those. Uh, so and Mark seems to believe, like me, that the uh, state will take the series, but he told me some things offensively about this group that's rather interesting. And so... I'm going to use some of his insight as part of our preview today. And uh, let's go ahead and get to that after we talk to uh, talk about our friends at Bulldog Burger Company. Longtime sponsors for this show. Man, I love Bulldog Burger Company. You do too. Chances are you ought to have a raving love affair with them. If not, you should. Bulldog Burger Company always, always, always satisfies me. There's so many places you go, it's just kind of hit or miss. It's such consistency. A Bulldog Burger Company. And, of course, with the Eat With Us group, you expect that. that. That's a family of restaurants that have served the Golden Triangle so well for so many years. But Bulldog Burger Company, it's a great place for lunch. It's a great place for dinner. Whether you're, whether you're going out with friends or family, maybe you want to have an adult beverage, a glass of wine, I don't know. You can do that at Bulldog Burger Company. In addition to that, too, you're going to have a great restaurant-quality hamburger, it's unlike anything else you're going to find. The selections on the menu are absolutely incredible. I've had them all. I have. And I've never walked away disappointed in an experience at Bulldog Burger Company. So put your feet under their table. Let them handle everything. Get the spring rolls as your appetizer. They'll make you and everybody around you better looking. And then, you know, hey, maybe you get that BLT salad. You may like it fried. I like it grilled. Or you get the Bryant, the Lauren... The freshman 15, if you're a newbie, and there's nothing wrong with that, I love new customers. I would start with the Bulldog. And then next time you come in, maybe get that Pimentology add bacon. That'll put some hair on your chest. It will, for sure. And get that chocolate shake to go. You'll be glad you did. Just kind of cap that experience with a good palate cleanser. You can ride that ride home with a smile. Three great locations to serve you. University Drive in Stark Vegas, Gloucester Street there in Tupelo, Lake Harbor Drive in the Ridge and Flowood area. Bulldog Burger Company, the place where people go to meet. M-E-A-T. All right. Let's take a look at Alabama. And if you're like me, it's just like, you know, I'm, I'm in the big maroon bubble, right? I'm a fan of the league, but for some reason, I just, I've just i only watched, I think, Alabama play one time this year. You know, my schedule's a little different than yours. Obviously, I'm on the road a lot uh, chasing the Diamond Dogs around. But I just I have not had a chance to watch them play much. I've kept up with them statistically and kind of seeing where they are in the standings, but I just haven't seen a lot of them. So let's work through this together. All right, the Tide got off to a great start. They swept Manhattan College. You'd, you'd expect that. I mean, the Jaspers, you know, are the Jaspers. Probably more of a basketball school than a baseball school, but uh, they take care of them. Only one of those games was truly competitive, and that was a Sunday game. Alabama with a pair of shutouts in games one and two, but uh, the Sunday game is 11-8 in favor of Alabama. They didn't take care of Middle Tennessee State. And then uh, Alabama State comes in for a seven-inning affair. Alabama absolutely rolled through Valpo. You know, we've had them recently as a non-conference opponent. But, uh, you know, th they were the second weekend non-conference foe for Alabama. And all three of these games ended in a mercy rule. 
Yeah, 14-2, 13-3, 11-1. So getting it done, and of course you look up and it's like, man, these guys are just kind of rolling through. Well, then they go over to Birmingham, play at Regents Field. Took them 10 innings, but they knocked off UAB. They go down to the Frisco Classic, and they take down number 21, Indiana, in seven. They get by Arizona, 7-6, and then they drop their first game of the year to Dallas Baptist. And so really, really good start. Midweek game against Troy comes. They survived that thing 8-7. And then Lipscomb. You know, Lipscomb recently beat Tennessee, as you guys are aware. And again, Lipscomb was picked to win the Atlantic Sun. Now, they're not going to unless something crazy happens. They're currently 11-10 in the Atlantic Sun. Of course, that's the same conference as Austin P. Austin P. and Stetson, just one game out of first place. Jacksonville, the Dolphins, uh, lead the Atlantic Sun with a 15-6 record. But overall, they're just 22-20. and uh, looking at Austin P, they're 28 and 16. Them and Stetson both are having pretty good years, but uh, I, you're not going to get an at-large bid for Atlantic Sun unless something really crazy happens. Occasionally it happens, but um, but nevertheless, you go back to uh, Alabama's series with Lipscomb, and uh, it was very very one-sided as you would imagine. Uh, Alabama takes all three games. Uh, that Friday night game, or excuse me, Saturday, the first game on Saturday. I guess they got pushed back to the doubleheader. That was. 20 to 13 game. It's pretty rough, man. Pretty rough. All right, so Alabama then heads to Southern Miss, and Alabama's playing well, feeling good about life, and they go down to Hattiesburg and go to Pete Taylor Park and come away with an L. Southern Miss gets them 9 to 7. But again, a great start in non conference. And you go back and look, I mean, you only drop two games in non-conference. You feel pretty good about your standing. You're like, you know, hey, I know it's going to get tougher, but, man, we've built up some confidence. They host Tennessee that first weekend. And Friday night they get shelled to 11-3. But they bounce back and take Saturday and Sunday to beat number five Tennessee. And we're all thinking, okay, Alabama may be for real. I, I didn't think so. I thought Alabama and Georgia both were kind of fool's gold, kind of middle-of-the-pack SEC teams. So after that Tennessee game, they take it down. Uh, they travel to Montgomery to play Alabama State, beat those guys 15-7. And then they go to Georgia. And they take on the Bulldogs. And I thought it was a situation here. We're going to – somebody's a fraud and somebody's not. Georgia sweeps all three games. But they were very competitive. 9-5, 6-5, 10-5, or mostly competitive. But all of a sudden you look up and like, hey, Alabama's – two and four in the SEC. They'll be okay, right? Or maybe not. They get Belmont in, uh, they play Belmont in Huntsville. That's interesting. Take the show on the road and play the the Bruins. Yeah. All right, so then uh, South Carolina makes their way to Alabama, number 10 South Carolina. And again, I've always felt like South Carolina is probably a top 25 team. They're not a top 10 team. But Alabama gets them two out of three. It's a Thursday, Friday, Saturday series. They win Thursday and Friday, and they lose a one-run affair on Saturday. So now you think, okay, well, maybe Alabama's a little better than we thought. They go to Samford. We've done that too. I like going to Samford. I, I do. and it's, it's, um, I like going over there for you guys, right? Those of you that live in the greater Birmingham area. I think it's a cool thing we go over there. But we do. And it seems like every time we go, it's a bit of a tussle. But uh, same thing for Alabama. They go over there and win 11-10 over Samford. And then they go to Kentucky. And we kept waiting. And we've had to wait a long time. Kentucky still leads the Southeastern Conference right now, tied with Arkansas. But uh, they go to Lexington and uh, get smacked around pretty good. The only game that's really competitive was the first game, 6-2. And then Kentucky wins 7-0 and 10-1 to to close out a series. Alabama then hosts South Alabama. They drop that one, too, and then go to Arkansas. Excuse me, they hosted Arkansas, and they lose game one of that series. And so all of a sudden, you know, this losing streak becomes a little bit concerning. It's a five-game losing streak. Well, they bounce back. They beat Arkansas in 10 and then take the Sunday game. So series winners over the number one Razorbacks at the time, that's a loud win. Then the next thing you know, you host uh, UAB and you drop that midweek game to them. Tough. Well, after that, A&M rose to number one in the country 
And then they went into Tuscaloosa and took two out of three. They win the Friday game, had a doubleheader on Friday, won them both. And then uh, Alabama comes back and wins a 10-9 game on Saturday to salvage a game. Sanford then rolls into uh, into Tuscaloosa and gets beat 14-5. And then last weekend, of course, Alabama goes to Oxford and takes uh, two of three. They went 12 nothing on Thursday. Mercy ruled the Rebels. And then, then lose a 9-8 game on Friday and bounce back to win the series 10-3 on Saturday. But uh, no midweek game for them this week. But, uh, again, you kind of look at the SEC numbers here and you realize you know, this is a team that's been a lot of these one-run type ball games, as have we. But they're not just going to go away. Uh, they're not. Now, one of the, the big issues with them is uh, been on the pitching side. I had a lot of injuries. Riley Quick, a guy that uh, stayed pursued as a uh, offensive lineman and then told him he could pitch too. He likes to go to Alabama. And I remember when this happened, when he committed to Alabama baseball, some people were like, well, it's Alabama. And all due respect, if you're, if you're playing baseball and you pick Alabama over Mississippi State, it's almost like telling me you don't want to compete. I could get, okay, what's well, a football scholarship, but yeah, it's Bama. Yeah, Bama doesn't have any real rich baseball tradition this generation. I mean, it's just true. I mean, I'm not being disrespectful, but that's just the reality of it. So it doesn't make any sense to me. We're going to pick Alabama. It's Bama. Yeah. Yeah. We're Mississippi State. Get it right. All right. So let's look here at the inside some numbers here. This Alabama offense is, is good, and they've had some guys, some newcomers that have kind of stepped up and done some big things for them. You know, Gage Miller, got, I mean, he's got 18 tanks this year. Leads a team with a 386 average. Pretty impressive, right? And uh, this is a team, too, that you know lost a lot, had to hit the portal hard, and uh, you start working through all that, and you, and you still have to kind of take all these personalities and skill sets and find a way to kind of you know, mesh them together as a team. And you need somebody out there to kind of lead the way. In many respects, that's been Gage Miller. You know, come from Bishop State Community College. You know, he's a guy originally from Pennsylvania that uh, went down and did some good things in the junior college ranks and then ends up at Alabama. You know, he's a first-year player up there. And maybe a guy that you haven't heard much from just because Alabama baseball hadn't made a ton of headlines. But Gage Miller is a guy that can absolutely swing it. Absolutely. And he's proven it. Now, Matt Gassetti was a catcher that we saw some last year. He's having the best year of his college career, too, hitting 364. He's got four tanks, 35 RBI. And again, this is another solid guy in the lineup. Now, Justin LeBron is a freshman and is uh, – is, as Etheridge told me, they brought him in, and he was kind of a defense guy first. Well, now this kid is hitting three-hole. Yeah, he's hitting 346, got 11 jacks, 32 ribbies. And so you start working through the top half of this order, and you realize you got some guys with some real home run potential. Now, T.J. McCants, former Ole Miss Rebel, you, you talk about a guy that improved his standing in life. He likes to go on a transfer portal. And, you know, Mississippi State kind of kicked the tires with him, too. Guys, he is having the best year of his college career. Now, and I will say this, it's a credit to Ole Miss fans. When they showed up last weekend, TJ got a really nice ovation from the Ole Miss fans up there. Of course, he was part of that NAFL championship team at Ole Miss. Uh, but, yeah, there was no love lost. I mean, excuse me, there's no bitterness there. So it was nice to see that. I remember seeing the, uh, the clip that made the rounds of T.J. going out and getting the applause and kind of tipping the cap to fans. But uh, this is a guy here, again, he goes in the portal, and sometimes you see guys that have a transformation. They get with a different hitting coach or they get with a different pitching coach, and all of a sudden they kind of see something. It's a minor adjustment that kind of changes things, and that's what you're seeing with T.J. McCants. He doesn't have that long, loopy swing that he used to have. And, guys, he's at 13 jacks this year. Yeah. T.J. McCants, a guy that in many respects was kind of a walking out at Ole Miss. But the change of scenery has done a good thing for him. Uh, but 13 jacks and 44 ribbies, that, that is loud. That is absolutely loud. We're in 44, Reggie Jackson's number. Uh, Ian Petrutz hitting 320, also a regular. Just five jacks and 36 ribbies. But, all, you know, we talked about that lineup last week. 
you know, at Vanderbilt, you know, you, there's not a lot of uh, dead outs, right? I mean, you get a lot of guys in there, the team, they're hitting really well. And uh, so you never got that inning where it's like, okay, great. We got seven, eight, nine coming up. We can relax. This Alabama order is a little bit like that. And it's much better than the Ole Miss order. You know, Ole Miss only had the one guy, Ethan Legge, hitting above 300. And now he may be on the shelf this weekend. Um, this Alabama group is different, though. They have five regulars that are hitting above 300. And as a team, they're hitting 311. So th- the name of this game is going to be Mississippi State's ability to get Alabama out because this is a group that's going to put the ball in play. I mean, you start working through these strikeout numbers – Guys, they struck out 297 times. You say, well, Steve, that's a lot. They struck out their opponents almost 100 more times. They're putting the ball in play. Now, they're also a team that's grounded into a lot of double plays. It's kind of part of the deal, too. But when you start running these numbers here offensively, the numbers don't match up to the record. And the reason that is is Alabama's not a great defensive team. They're also not a great pitching team because of some injuries. And part of the issue, too, is with the – with the defense, is it, they're, it's not like they kick the ball around, as Etheridge says. They're 974 in the league. But there's a lot of balls they just haven't been able to get to. Don't always have the range that you're looking for. So you hit some balls hard, and then you see what happens, right? You, good things happen when you hit the baseball hard. That's how the game works, right? So let's look. Let's face it, friends. We live in uncertain times. Security probably more important now than ever before. That's why it's important to keep you, your family, your property safe by working with my friends at Eufy. That's E-U-F-Y dot com. Let me tell you a little bit about this new video smart lock they have. It's super cool because basically you get a three-in-one security system here. You can have everything on just one device instead of having it outside of your house look rather tacky because you got all kinds of stuff out there. It's not just about your security, but convenience. No more concerns about losing keys. You can assign passwords to your family members, and you can see who's kind of coming and going. you got that immigrated camera, too. Uh, it's easy to install. You can set it up with just a Phillips screwdriver. You know, you don't have to go to a class on how to use power tools. No drilling required. You get keyless entry. You don't have to worry about fumbling with the keys when you're getting back with a, an armful of groceries, right? How convenient is that? That in and of itself is a great benefit. you got fingerprint recognition. It's unlocking. Got that AI self-learning chip. So the more you use it, the more accurate it's going to be. You don't have to worry about the battery. It's got a rechargeable battery that can last around four months. And you get a notification before it runs out, so you don't have to compromise your family security. You got passcode unlocking, remote control, 2K clear sight camera. You can see who's at your door. You see these videos online all the time. Don't you think it's time for you to set something up so you can have the peace of mind of knowing that you don't have people constantly going in and out of your property? There's no monthly fee. Unlike other brands that charge you a monthly fee, you can have your recordings locally and never have to pay for storage. How cool is that? It's convenient. It's safe. It's a must-have for your home today. If you already have like a video doorbell, you know sometimes people want to come and steal your, your doorbell. You don't have to worry about with, that with this. All right, so let's be sure to visit... Eufy Video Lock, that's E-U-F-Y, official.com, forward slash video lock. And it's time for you to gain control of your door. Again, that's Eufy, E-U-F-Y. All right, Bulldog fans, our friends from Tecovis want to remind you that uh, it's festival season, it's concert season, it's sundress season. Yes, it is. And you know you need some nice boots to go along with every bit of that. And Tecovis is your stop for the best in Western wear. Tecovis has seasonal and limited edition offerings this spring and summer, including men's and women's boots, apparel, hats, bags, and so much more. All Tecovis boots are made by hand in a very time-honored tradition with timeless styles that are always on trend. And Tecovis has first wear comforts. So no break-in period. You know how tough that can be with a brand new pair of boots. You can put these bad boys on and ride that ride with a smile. It's hard to find this level of comfort paired with the same level of style. So stop by your local Tacova store, have a complimentary beverage or two, shop the new styles, the smell of fresh leather, and a friendly staff are always at your service. Many stores even have leather custom branding to make your boots truly personalized. And with regular live music and events, there's no in-store experience quite like it. If you can't make it to a store, visit Tacovas. 
That's T-E-C-O-V-A-S dot com. They offer free shipping on all boots, as well as free returns and exchanges ship right to your door. Go to tecovis.com and find your new favorite pair of boots today. Inside these pitching stuff. Now, Greg Ferrone has emerged as probably their best pitcher. He's got a complete game, leads the team in ERA at 3.10 among the regulars. 12 appearances, 11 starts. He started out as their primary midweek pitcher. And then when Riley Quick goes down with injury, he moves to the weekend. And it's done outstanding. I mean, in poor old Riley Quick, man, I guess he goes just three innings in, the, uh, in, in his first start of the year, and then he's done. I mean, nobody's going to feel sorry for Alabama, but it's one of those things, too, you look at. It just really – it's disappointing to see a young person have to deal with that. And, and sadly, it's part of baseball these days. But, uh, you know, Ferron's a guy that we'll definitely see – uh, he'll be one of the starters on the weekend. And he is a guy, too, that really challenges hitters. He, he's not a huge strikeout guy. And what I mean by that is he, he's not Hagen Smith by any stretch. He's got 54 punch outs against just 16 walks, so a little bit over 3-1. to one. Uh, He's allowed seven home runs on the year, but basically he competes in his own. This is a guy that gets under barrels, gets a lot of soft contact. Uh, opponents are hitting just 230 against him. But he's a guy, leads him. He's been a workhorse, 52 innings pitch, but you, you kind of do the math on that, and you, it works out to about five innings a game. He's worked a little bit deeper as of late, but uh, that's a real concern for them because the bullpen is, in many respects, really, really thin. And a lot of it's because you've had to move some guys, you know, to the weekend, and then all of a sudden then you've got to have some other buddies, some guys step up and pitch in the midweek. But, uh, you know, Zane Adams, another guy that's been a regular for them, uh, 10 starts on the year, 4-4-3 ERA. Another guy that works around four or five innings of ball game. We, we expect to see him. Ben Hass is the guy that they really thought was going to be their guy, and it just hadn't worked out for him. ERA of 7.31. He's made 11 starts on the year, and he's not working deep in ball games. Average in just at four innings an outing. And that's brutal. That's absolutely brutal. And part of the issue, too, is that you know, he's just a guy that hadn't been able to compete in his own a little bit. Not be able to get long, not be able to be effective. And so 38 hits, 36 runs. Ten of those have been home runs. So he is a guy that's been somewhat susceptible to the long ball. Uh, you get a little deeper in this thing. You know, Alton Davis, of course, is a guy on the back end. Really good player. Uh, we've seen him before, too. Uh, very competitive kid, too, for sure. But, uh, yeah, four saves on the year for him. You know, he, he is the back-end guy, and he can throw twice on a weekend. The question is, is can they get the game to him? Yeah, I'm a big proponent of this. Is uh, If I'm going to lose on Friday, I want to know as soon as possible so I can kind of figure out how I want to do things. You know, because I'm not going to go throw big arms. Because it doesn't matter how, big you, how bad you get beat on Friday night. I mean, just throw a walk-on or the water boy or whatever. Just get the game over and mop it up. But um, you want to save some arms for Sunday because the last thing you want is to be in that two, three run game in the middle innings and you got to go cash in some big arms and you exhaust them and lose the ball game. It's tough. Aid Moser was the guy they expected to be their Sunday guy. He's made uh, 15 appearances, three starts, ERA of 924, which is last on the team. So a 5.30 ERA as a team, but pitching has been a real issue for them. And, and it's not just been, you know, hey, walk in the ballpark. It's just about getting guys out. You've got to be able to get guys out. Opponents are hitting 253 against them. Uh, but when you start running through the numbers here, they're just, you know, they're, they're going to walk you a little bit. But they are, you know, they, they want to compete. But uh, they're a team that, in order to avoid the walk sometimes, they end up catching too much to plate. It's true. Look at the conference numbers, too. I love when we can toggle between those. Um, on the pitching side, we'll start there. ERA as a team is 6.71 against SEC opponents only. That, that's a big number. It, it, it really is. And, and again, you look at Ferron here, 3.68. And that's decent. I mean, hey, that, that guy can go out there and get you three to four, allow just three or four runs in a game. Over the course of nine innings, which again he hadn't worked a complete game. I guess he has one complete game, but uh, 
that could save some bullpen for the rest of the weekend. So, you know, that, that's a big part of things. It's just working deeper in ball games, But uh, they have really struggled to do that. In Southeastern Conference play, they do not have a regular pitcher with an ERA better than 368. That's tough. Now, on the hitting side, just in conference only, you know, again, you want to see who's doing well, who's do, who's not. Uh, Cade Snell is a guy we did mention earlier. He, he's not one of the starters, but uh, kind of a part-time guy. He's got 15 starts in 21 of the SEC games and uh, hitting 400. M- mainly a single hitter, but he's got – I guess maybe that's not a fair assessment. He's got uh, 26 hits and seven of them are doubles. He's got three tanks too, but uh, – you know, Will Hodo is another guy that uh, we know pretty well. He's hitting 308 in SEC play, which is better than his overall average. He's less than 300. But, um, you know, we talked a little bit about you know, some of these guys that we know. You know, William Hameter is another guy that's been around, but he, you know, he's basically played as a reserve. But you start working through these numbers and you begin to realize guys like Justin LeBron, freshman shortstop like him, Guys like him hitting 354 in SEC play, you just don't see that very often. You just don't. It just doesn't happen that way. T.J. McCants, one home run in SEC play, an average of 293. But, again, uh, happy for the kid to kind of get out of Oxford and kind of see, uh, you know, what it looks like to play for somebody else. And, and it's again, it's sometimes it's a bat, a bait, a bat path issue. And that was really kind of the case for him. Uh, Look at some fielding numbers here with Alabama. Again, in conference play. Conference play, it's been 975. And you're just kind of working through this. You know, Justin LeBron, the shortstop. You know, again, he was supposed to be a defense early guy. He leads the team in errors in SEC play. And I guess we'll look at it overall, too. Uh, looking at the errors here, yeah, Justin LeBron with 10 errors on the year. And, and, and again, you're going to have some of that with a freshman. That's not a criticism of him. It's just kind of a statement of fact. But uh, I like this Alabama offense, and uh, I like State's opportunities to win this ball game, win this series. And it's one we really need to get. I mean, we talk about the possibilities, right? And we talked about the shift in conversation that, hey, we may be making a coaching change at the end of the year, and now all of a sudden we're in a position that we could potentially host. And we're not there yet. We're not there. Uh, you got nine SEC games left to play. You need to win at least five of those four. But if you could pick up an extra one somewhere along the way. And I, I truly believe 17 SEC wins gets you in the conversation to host. I think 18 probably wraps it up. If you can find a way to get to 18, of course, that means you've got to win six games of the final nine, which is certainly possible. But it means you're going to have to either win all three series or pick up a sweep somewhere. And this Alabama team is a tough team. And they really are. You look at 9 and 12 in the league and say, okay, well, they're behind us. But, uh, you know, they're still playing for something meaningful too. That's important to understand. We're not going to play many teams that are just playing out the string the rest of the way. And you got to think when Missouri comes in here, they may already know their fate. They may still be playing to get into Hoover. So we're not going to get an off weekend at any point. Of course, Arkansas is uh, vying for an SEC championship and – uh, the opportunity to be a top eight national seed. And it's certainly at this point, they've earned that. But they're not there yet. And when you look at the Arkansas schedule, you know, we talk about these teams that are ahead of Mississippi State, you know, in the SEC standings. You're like, well, who's the most likely, you know, to come down? You know, who's, who's the team that may, you know, kind of cool off a little bit down the stretch? Well, Arkansas is one of those teams. They certainly are. Kentucky could be one of those teams. You know, could Mississippi State play their way into a top four situation? Well, you know, that, that would certainly bode well for Mississippi State. But, uh, you know, looking here at the Arkansas schedule, this is important to understand. Arkansas is in Lexington this weekend. We touched on that earlier this week. You know, they're 39-7 and seven overall and 16-5 and five in conference. They're going to play the only other team that's won 16 games so far but you got to go to Lexington and play a very, very tough Kentucky team. And I don't just mean tough because they're number eight in the country. But they're a mentally tough team in their own yard. You could certainly see them taking this series. Well, then next week, State goes to Arkansas. And then Arkansas goes to College Station, Texas. 
And let's be honest about this. If Arkansas wins the Southeastern Conference, and I picked them to begin the year to do that, I didn't think A&M was going to be as good as they have been. Didn't think Kentucky was going to be as good as they have been. But down the stretch, this Arkansas team is going to earn it. You've got to go on the road and play the, the team that you're tied with in the SEC standings, and then you finish up the year against the team that's a game behind you, the number one team in the country. It's brutal, man. It is. And so you think about that Arkansas schedule. There is some uh, room to move there because I think they're going to drop some games. Now, they're capable of winning those games, but offensively this you know Arkansas team has been a little bit um, – yeah, I guess you'd say offensively challenged this year. I think that's a fair assessment. And so if they get into a situation, they get into a slugfest with somebody, where maybe they have a pitcher having a tough day, it's going to be a difficult day at the yard. And you look at this Kentucky team, 33-9 and nine overall, 16-5 and five in the SEC. And, of course, they host Arkansas this weekend. That's tough, number two team in the country. Well, then they go to Florida, and you feel like, you know, of course, Florida's playing for something, but you got a chance to go down there and get that one. And then they finish up with Vanderbilt at home. So none of that is a walk in the park by any stretch of the imagination. You know, and if you look at you know Texas A&M, you feel like those guys probably have a chance to do some pretty good things. You know, their their schedule is not uh, maybe as daunting as um, Arkansas and Kentucky. And uh, I'm pulling that up. You can hear me type it, I'm sure. But uh, look at the A&M schedule. Of course, you close out with that Arkansas thing, and then that'll be great, and that'll impact a lot for the NCAA tournament. That will impact seed in a major way. I think we all see it for what it is. And then you get a little deeper into this thing, and uh, you start thinking, okay, A&M will beat Alex Box this weekend. It's a launching pad down there, and there's some power in this A&M lineup. And I like a and to take a series. Uh, LSU, of course, uh, still trying to play for something. You know, they're not guaranteed a spot in Hoover either. And then a and goes to Ole Miss. And then at home against Arkansas. So a much more favorable schedule for the Aggies. And you start thinking now, if Arkansas and Kentucky beat each other up, and uh, Arkansas has, uh, you know, maybe drops a game to a Mississippi State team, you start thinking A&M may be the team that wins the SEC this year. Because, again, they have the more favorable schedule. And then the, uh, the final team that's ahead of us is Tennessee. And their schedule, not, not as daunting as Arkansas and probably not as good as A&M. And that's the thing. Again, you begin to work all through this stuff and you start thinking – you know, every game matters this time of year. I mean, you always need it. You do. But you, you want to be playing your best baseball when it's the most meaningful time of year, and that's kind of where we are. Uh, Tennessee, this weekend, as you guys know, will play um, Florida. They were scheduled to start last night, but the game got postponed due to rain. So it'll be a Friday doubleheader and then a game on Saturday. But you, th- you feel like, hey, Tennessee should take that series at Florida. Well, then they got to go to Nashville. That'll be interesting. And then you get South Carolina at Lindsey Nelson. So they're playing three teams that still have something very much to play for. And two of those are on the road. And so, yeah, there is a chance for State to move up into the top four and earn that bye in the SEC tournament. And, of course, the more important thing beyond just making the tournament and being a top four is it is an absolute rarity for a team in the top four of the Southeastern Conference standings not to host an NCAA regional. And so we just have to win some games. There is a real opportunity for some traffic to clear in front of us as some of the teams that we're chasing are going to play head-to-head. Big part of things. And uh, to be honest with you, we need Vanderbilt and Georgia to win some games for us. You know, we we don't play Kentucky. And so if somebody out there that we've defeated beats Kentucky, well, then that helps our RPI. 
and of course, there's still the whole thing about you know playing North Alabama. You know, it's going to be interesting to see how we handle that. The D1 baseball committee reached out and said, "Hey, don't be canceling games late because of RPI." You know, so that that's a thing too. We may end up having to play that game, and our RPI is dreadful. We played Alcorn State. We dropped, I think, eight or nine spots in the RPI. There's not a much, not enough time to kind of make that ground up. So. That's why taking on Alabama this weekend, who has an RPI in top 15, that's why every win against them matters so much more. But we just need to take care of business. Mississippi State takes care of their business. Everything else kind of works itself out. It's as simple as that. You keep winning. Other people around you will win and some will lose. But the good thing is, is some of those teams that lose will be teams that are ahead of you in the standings. Uh, so a lot left to play for for Mississippi State. All right, time for today's top 10 list is always brought to you by CloseWithBlair.com. at C-L-O-S-E with Blair, B-L-A-I-R.com. Blair Chandler is a mortgage professional. Blair is a guy that knows how to get things done. Whether you're looking for a game day condo, which is always a good option to consider, that could be your retirement home. Say, so you know what, hey, the kids are out of the house. We don't need this much house. We'll just go downsize and live in Starkville and be able to go to all the ball games. What a great retirement that would be, Right. Just go sit and enjoy the Diamond Dogs and be there for men's and women's basketball, go to some softball, some volleyball. I mean, you could just make that your whole life. What could be better than that? And, and the grandkids come to go to good ball games and come stay with you. Yeah. But if you're just starting out in life, looking to buy a home for the first time, maybe life has uh, forced you into a reset of sorts, you can't do better than Blair Chandler. Visit him at CloseOfBlair.com. Let me give you his phone number, 601-500-2344. 601-500-2344. 23 years of experience. Blair knows how to get things done. A true bulldog, a season ticket holder in multiple places, multiple sports, has a place here in town uh, in addition to his place down there in Madison County. But uh, he's one of us. I like to keep business in the family whenever we can. That's again, that's closedblair.com. Okay, so Roy, Samanthi, uh, my friend, your friend, and, uh, you know, a guy that's basically kind of stepped up and said, um, hey, I'd love to put these lists on uh, Spotify for you. Roy had an idea last year, and I thought we had done this, but we didn't. And I don't know if you're aware of this. So here is the text uh, from Roy. So May is Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. You may not know about know this about me, but I fall into this category. Of course, uh, Roy is uh, from Philippine descent. And so he goes, hey, can we put a playlist together to celebrate your sidekick being a Filipino-American? How about a Filipino-American singer's playlist? And so I said, sounds like a good idea. And um, I thought we did this, but we did not. So we're going to honor Roy Samanti. And all of our, uh, our great friends that are Asian American Pacific Islanders in your month. This is a really diverse list, and you're going to be surprised at some of the people that are on this list. So with that in mind, let's get it going here. Okay, number 10, it's a country song. How about that? Yeah, that's right. Neil McCoy, a descendant from the Philippines. We're going to go with The Shake, The Shake from Neil McCoy. Right, because that's what that's what we're looking for. Right, the song is about women, you know. Um, but it's like you know, some guys prefer this, some guys prefer that. Neil said he prefers the shake. All right, number nine. I really dig this one. It's Haley Stanfield or Haley Steinfield, excuse me. Haley Steinfield. I, I love the airy, breathy nature of this. I love the kind of the overproduced sound. It's it really has kind of a haunting sound to it. It's Afterlife uh, from Haley Steinfeld. I, I, I dig it. I do. I, it, it feels like something from a different time in many respects. All right, number eight. I don't know how this guy made the list, but Roy gave me the list, the, the name. I, I picked the songs. He gave me a list of artists. But uh, en Enrique Iglesias also has some uh, Pacific Islander heritage in his life. It's true. And I picked this song. I know many of you thought we'd go Balamos, but uh, we're not. No, I, I, again, with this rasp that I have these days, I, I couldn't do my Spanish whisper. But uh, I went with Do You know? you know? Do you know what it feels like loving someone? You know, um, 
And it reminds me of the great Rob and Big episode when they go through the car wash and they put this song on and everybody dances around. And, and uh, it, it's such a hilarious clip. And uh, also, too, I'll tell you one of my finest moments on Twitter is years ago, Big Black followed me on Twitter. God rest his soul. The pride of Wiggins, Mississippi, a former Stone County High School Tomcat passed away. Man, I hate that. I, I do. I, I loved Robin Big. I, I used to DVR that at Jet Show, and, and uh, I know they play ridiculousness all the time now, but the Robin Big stuff was amazing. It absolutely was. I loved it. It was so funny, and uh, I know some of it was probably scripted, but um, it was a real reality show that brought a lot of enjoyment to a lot of people. And uh, I, I dug it. I really did. Of course, they you know they went from Robin Big, and then they went to the Fantasy Factory, and then eventually uh, Big Black left the show. And uh, yeah, you hate that. You do. And um, but yeah, it was uh, pretty cool when he followed me on Twitter. I know that sounds like a minor thing, but uh, Big Black Mississippi State guy used to always tweet negative things about Ole Miss. And um, yeah, he's a bulldog. God rest his soul. All right, number seven, and uh, kind of an homage here to the 70s rock band player they had a great song called baby come back well vanessa hudgens was made famous by high school musical she was a love interest very talented has a song said come back to me and of course they have the uh, i don't know if it's truly a sample or they're just kind of singing it in the same cadence but it's baby come back yeah any kind of fool could see I was wrong, and I just can't live without you. We grew up with that stuff, man. Those guys in the 70s could really play. They really could. The bass lines in the 70s, amazing, amazing. Ace, player, exile, bands like that, great. But, uh, yeah, Vanessa Hudgens, Come Back to Me, number seven. Number six, I absolutely love the song. And I don't listen to a lot of pop music. My girls would be really proud that I spent some time listening to Olivia Rodrigo. But the song, Happier... Is one of those songs that many people wouldn't record, right? Because like everybody wants to put their best foot forward and things like that. But there is some vulnerability with this song. And again, it's kind of that airy, breathy song from another era. I absolutely love what they did. The production value on this is amazing. But it's a song, Happier. And uh, it's basically like, I want you to be happy, but not happier than you were when we were us, right? And it's like... We haven't been able to stay together, and you've moved on, and I do want you to be happy, but um, I want the time that you're with me because I'm a little bit selfish and narcissistic to be the happiest time in your life, right? Uh, but yeah, no matter what you say, what you're willing to admit publicly, we've all kind of felt that way. Like when somebody else moves on from us, which is hard. I mean, it, it is so difficult. You know, relationships can be very difficult, but when you find out that somebody is... Uh, it's kind of moved on in life, you know. It, it makes you, it makes you do some self evaluation. It really does. And you're like, you know, hey, we can't be together. I don't want you to be unhappy, but I still want to know that I'm special to you, right? And maybe that's a little bit teenagerish, but it's 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 how we all feel. And no matter what you say, I mean, what you do, everybody has that. She just happened to put it to song. All right, number five, Nicole Schressinger who is an absolute bombshell, was uh, the front lady of the Pussycat Dolls. They had a huge hit, and every woman in the world sang this song. It's Don't You. Don't You Wish Your Girlfriend Was Hot Like Me? Well, we, we talk about being a little bit full of it. You know, there we go. But uh, it was a huge hit, and they only did a couple of albums. But, uh, you know, of course, she's done X Factor and stuff. Again, super talented lady, and um, very easy to look at, for sure. Uh, Pussycat Doll is kind of a corporate music type deal, but uh, had some hits, had a big following for sure. All right, number four, and I think these, I think this top four is absolutely excellent. There's no pop songs left, just so you know. We're through the country and through the pop segment of our show. Number four, one of the greatest stories in the history of rock music is that of Arnel Pineda. Now, Arnell was with a band called The Zoo out in the Philippines. You know, he kind of kicked it around or whatever, and he was with a cover band, and they used to do all this classic rock stuff, Led Zeppelin and stuff. 
And somebody had posted some videos of Arnell singing Journey songs. And, of course, Steve Perry you know, departed the band, a lot of health issues there. And Neil Sean, the legendary guitarist from Journey, who also played with Santana at Woodstock. Yeah, how about that? You didn't know that? It's true. At 16 years of age, on stage at Woodstock. Craziness. But all that I understood, Neil Sean sees these videos of YouTube and says this guy was really good. And so he reaches out to this guy on YouTube to get the contact information. So he emails Arnell Pineda, and Arnell dismissed it as a hoax. But they eventually got together, and he does do a really good job. He sounds a lot like Steve Perry. And uh, they put an album out. They've had a couple albums out. But uh, the first big hit for Journey without Steve Perry, with Arnell Pineda singing, was After All These Years. It is an absolutely incredible ballad. It's about a long-term relationship. You know, it's, uh, it's one of those songs, too, that um, will give you a bit of gratitude, for sure. All right, number three, Steve D., the, uh, I guess Josh Todd calls him, you know, the, the Philip. Pino Madman, or whatever. I uh, had a chance to see these guys a few times. Saw them at Rocklahoma, thank Mark. And um, so Steve D is a guitar player for Buck Cherry. And if you don't know Buck Cherry, you should. And they're always out touring, always. And um, I go back to kind of the gateway song for many of us into the band Buck Cherry. It is a song about doing drugs. But even if it wasn't, the guitar on this is incredible. The tone, incredible. It is a classic rock riff in many respects. It's a song lit up. And many of you right now have forgotten about that song, and you're going to put it on. You're going to be jamming it all weekend. You're going to say, I'm so glad I listened to Boneyard. It reminds me of all my old favorites. I don't do drugs, and I haven't for a long time, but I love the song lit up. I, I, I absolutely love this song. And I do feel somewhat guilty at times singing the lyrics, but... Um, this is a banger, man. Uh, kids today talk about, oh, this, this is a banger. Yeah, you know, A lot of those kids have no clue what it is. But Lit Up from Buck Cherry. We had never even heard this band, and all of a sudden this video is on MTV and, and everywhere else, and uh, the song's on radio, and you're like, who are these guys? Absolutely phenomenal band. Number two, there are a few people in my lifetime that I truly consider musical geniuses, but Bruno Mars is one of them. I think Bruno Mars plays 18 or 19 instruments. His ability to compose songs, absolutely legendary. has a huge following. And that's the thing. There are some artists that kind of transcend genres, and Bruno Mars is one of them. And so we're going to go with Locked Out of Heaven for number two from Bruno Mars. I love the, uh, I love the, the percussion on this. It's great. Love Bruno Mars. When he did that Super Bowl halftime show, it was incredible. Number one, and you may not have known this, this may be even a bigger surprise than finding out that Enrique Iglesias has ties to the Pacific Islanders, but it's Kirk Hammett from Metallica. Yeah, let that sink in for a second. Yeah. You always wondered how he kept a good tan all the time. Well, now you know, right? Kirk Hammett, one of the most legendary guitar players of all time. And Kirk may be one of the best bandmates ever, too. Like, if you've seen Some Kind of Monster, the documentary Metallica, like, Kirk is, like, the most peaceful, down-to-earth guy that never gets involved in any drama. It's very rare you even see him get aggravated, but, uh, man, he is an absolute virtuoso on the guitar. So we're going to go with Metallica's Master of Puppets is number one. And, um, guys, I'll, I'll tell you this. That whole... Going back... And thinking about that whole story, you know, how Kirk came to be, he left Exodus to replace Dave Mustaine. Dave Mustaine, of course, kicked out of Metallica, started Megadeth. And, um, you know, now here you are, you know, Kirk Hammett steps in and really kind of elevates the band to something else. And again, I'm, I'm a big Dave Mustaine guy too. And one of the things I love about Dave is his willingness to kind of say what's on his mind, even if it offends other people. Uh, it's funny, everybody has the right to be offended these days. It's true. It's true. And Dave is a guy that can be offensive. Um, he, he has said some things that uh, many of us think, just didn't have the courage to say. Uh, but that said, you know, Kirk was with Exodus, and they were a up-and-coming band. And But Kirk had uh, some technical skill that I think kind of um, exceeded that of Dave Mustaine. And I, I saw recently Dave said the three best 
you know, metal rhythm players of all time are Malcolm Young, James Hetfield, and himself. And there's probably some truth to that, to be quite honest with you. But when I go back and I think about the Metallica catalog, and uh, yeah, it's, it's become such a huge machine these days. But when I go back to you being introduced to Metallica, I remember when the new stuff came out, like my friend Jason Dossie was the biggest Metallica fan in the world. Whenever that, the, the new stuff came out, I, I was going to hear it. I didn't have to go buy the CDs because he was going to immediately have that available. You know, and he'd go dub you a copy. You know, he's like, hey, you got to have this. It's great. You know, uh, it's because of Jason Dossie, I really got into Metallica. I was in Metallica before the one video even hit, but... Um, but my favorite Metallica album is Master of Puppets, uh, without any question. And um, many of you got introduced to that song by watching Stranger Things on Netflix, and I'm so ready for Stranger Things to return. I absolutely love it. I'll probably go back and watch it again before the new season comes out. And I follow them on Twitter, and they're always teasing something. I'm so ready for that. I, I loved the last season of Stranger Things. And, of course, Eddie plays the, the solo to Master of Puppets, um, in the upside down to try to save everybody else. And so all of us, I remember Ani said, well, now we know Master Puppets will be the number one song in America come Monday. And it was. It's pretty amazing. It really is. But um, I, I'm so glad when music of my teen years kind of gets reintroduced to popular culture. And there's a lot of that on Stranger Things. Uh, so that's my top ten list. Uh, so congratulations to Roy and uh, to all of the artists and all of those that claim heritage as Asian American Pacific Islanders. I never knew that month existed. Uh, so we learned something. And so we celebrate that music. We'll be back on Monday with another fresh top ten list. You never know what direction we may go. You never not thought today we'd have Neil McCoy and Metallica and the Pussycat Dolls on the same list together. Yeah, and then threw in Enrique Iglesias just for kicks. Yeah, it's a great thing. So if you have ideas for the top ten list, reach out let us know. Best way to do that is to hit up Roy on Twitter at dogmatic67. That's D-A-W-G. M-A-T-I-C-6-7. He doesn't tweet out pictures of his food or silly stuff like that. You know, he doesn't like cut his finger, and like tweet it out so everybody can say, oh, I'm so sorry, you know. So you can consider following him. It's safe. Usually it's all Mississippi State stuff and then our great list. And if you're looking to find our list to listen to as you travel or work throughout your day, you can find him on Spotify under that same handle, Dogmatic67, D-A-W-G-M-A-T-I-C-6-7. Just follow You'll be happy you did. All right, next segment of the show brought to you by Campus Bookmart, right? Campus Bookmart. That's the king or queen, no matter how you want to slice it. That is the pinnacle of places to go get Mississippi State merchandise. A lot of people try to peddle you Mississippi State merch. You do, I mean, you get on Facebook and you're scrolling along and it's, you know, some site pops up with some uh, unlicensed T-shirt. Next thing you know, you order it. It takes two months to get here and it's crimson, Right. Here's the deal. Stick with the winners. The winners reside and work at Campus Bookmark. Go by and see their smiling faces next time you're in town. You can peruse their fine selections of Mississippi State merch, whether you're looking to update your wardrobe, maybe outfit a new room, the fan cave. Maybe you need some Mississippi State wall art. Maybe you need a diploma frame. That's always a great gift. It's a great grandparent gift or a favorite aunt and uncle gift because your graduate's going to put that thing in the frame and they're going to keep it forever, right? Forever. You don't you don't trade out frames later. You don't. And so it's a great memorable gift, a very thoughtful gift too. So great selection of diploma frames there at Campus Bookmart. If you can't make it to town, visit them on the World Wide Web at campusbookmart.net. Use promo code BSR, right? Beautiful Steve Robertson saving you shipping on all orders over 75 bucks just by listening to this show. I love Campus Bookmart. I haven't been in there in a few weeks. I need to go by there and check them out. And because, uh, you know, it's that time of year. You know, got friends and you know, nephews and nieces and people like that that are graduating. And I, I like to get a Mississippi State merch. And uh, another gift idea, too, if you have a high school graduate that's making their way to Mississippi State, maybe get them a gift card to Campus Bookmart. Yeah, think about that. Or just buy them some merch and have it shipped directly to them. You don't want them showing up on campus underprepared. The more Mississippi State merchandise we have in our lives, the happier we are. All right, let's take a look around the league this weekend. It's going to be an interesting week. It always is. You know, it's like one of the things that I said about last weekend series 
Ani and I were talking about this on a dude effect. Um, I guess it was last night. But uh, the thing about that series, and, and I, I hate to use hyperbole, but it reminds me, for all of you old guys, remember that 95 wild card series between the Yankees and the Mariners and how amazing that was? It was incredible. Because we're thinking, we don't, we don't need the wild card. And then we had that series, and you're like, man, this was so exciting. This series between Mississippi State and Vanderbilt, which to me was kind of reminiscent in the respect that every pitch mattered. Even in that 4 nothing ball game, you felt like, hey, you know, we, we're one pitch away here from making a game of this. Every at-bat mattered. Every out mattered. And that's meaningful baseball, right? You're not just hoping, oh, we just got to go get one, you know. We have to get one. We needed to get two. We did. And uh, what a heroic effort by the Bulldogs on Sunday to get that thing done. One of those games, and I've seen a ton of them in person, that's one of those I'll never forget. It was a surreal moment. But, um, yeah, so this weekend we're going to be doing some scoreboard watching ourselves. Again, it's, you know, we're trying to catch the top four. It's going to be difficult to do, but maybe somebody can kind of meet us halfway. As mentioned earlier, Tennessee and Florida were unable to play last night. So it's going to be a doubleheader today. First pitch is going to be at 2 p.m. Central for game one. And then, you know, I guess 45 minutes after that, they'll play game two. Uh, I like Tennessee to take the series. You know, Caglione's going to be Caglione. There's just not a lot of depth in that Florida order that's going to carry you. they got some athletes. Don't get me wrong. I mean, there's not a lot of easy outs, especially in the bottom half. It's, it's reminiscent of Vanderbilt, except Vanderbilt doesn't have a star like Caglione. But I just think Tennessee, against the Florida pitching staff that has not lived up to their potential, I like Tennessee to take the series. I wouldn't rule out a sweep, but let's just call it two for one. At some point, I think Cags get some maybe on Sunday. All right, Vanderbilt's at Georgia. This is a game between the number 17 Vanderbilt Commodores and number 19 Georgia Bulldogs. Georgia has been very, very, very good at home. Now, this Vanderbilt lineup, as we mentioned, doesn't have some gaudy home run numbers. You know, you've got some guys out there that have some ability. And in that park, you may see some very offensive games. Now, I do believe Vanderbilt has better pitching than Georgia. So they may do a better job keeping Georgia in the yard. But it's been so difficult to win on the road this year. We're going to take Georgia 2-1 to one in a very entertaining and competitive series. And, of course, J.D. Thompson's back after a, a week suspension. And so that's – was the Sunday starter for Florida. You know, it was his first SEC start. He is a left-hander with a lot of talent. They do expect him to be a regular rotation guy next year. So that could be a factor in what I think will be a rubber match on Sunday. Arkansas is at Kentucky. Now, here's the thing about this one. I think this may be the most intriguing series of the weekend. Not just because it's the top two teams in the Southeastern Conference record-wise, but – I think offensively, Arkansas is just a team that never really has an identity. You never know. Now, I'm going to pick Hagan Smith to win the night, and I know it's not really a hot take, but if Kentucky can win on Saturday, I think they take the series. I really do. I think they take the series. You always kind of tend to favor the home team in a rubber match on Sundays. You know, There are some exceptions, as you guys know, but – Maybe it's my heart rather than my head, but I'm going to pick Kentucky to take this series. And again, Kentucky's lost you know, the last two series, so Arkansas is trying to make it three in a row. I just don't know pitching up there is going to have the same proficiency that it does in Fayetteville. And again, Hagan Smith tonight, and so you like Arkansas there, but uh, I just think that Sunday game favors Kentucky. Uh, we've already discussed uh, Tennessee and Florida. Uh, Ole Miss is at Auburn. You start looking at the Ole Miss schedule. And we have. We've talked about it. You know, I, uh, I spoke to some people from the Ole Miss side uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday at Pearl. You know, they're just still hoping to kind of get to Hoover. And it's one of those things, too, you begin to look at and you think about, is that going to be an easy path for them? And, and the answer to that question is no. Uh, when you're an average to below average team in the SEC, you can never assume anything. And they are. And uh, listen, they'll get out there and compete. I just think with the injuries they've had on the pitching side, it's going to be tough to cover 27 innings, even on the road at Auburn, as bad as Auburn has been. Auburn's been competitive. Like I see some people say Auburn is just terrible. 
Well, you look at their record and you would think that. But then when you look at the scores and see how many one-run losses they've had, I just wonder, can Ole Miss get McMurray and Irish out consistently? Mississippi State did, and that was really the difference in the series. You, you made that order have to beat you with the bottom half. They were incapable of doing so. I mean, you, I think we gave up five runs on the weekend. You typically win uh, those series when you can hold people down like that. I mean, averaging less than two runs a game, it's tough to win. So this is probably Ole Miss's best chance to get a winning weekend. And then they go, they, they host AM. That's a losing weekend. Then they go to LSU. And that may be the last hurrah for Mike Bianco. And so, not a favorable schedule. Again, two of three on the road. And the one, one you get at home is the number one team in the country. But I just feel like this Auburn team at home will make this a very intriguing series. And, like, and it's so interesting. People say, well, you know, Steve, I mean, you know, the bottom line is this is, you know, Auburn hadn't been very good. I think if Ole Miss goes in there with that line of thinking, they're going to get beat. I really do. And uh, especially without Ethan Leger in the lineup, I'm taking Auburn. I'm taking Auburn in the series. And, um, again, kind of looking at the standings here really quick here. Auburn is four games behind Ole Miss. And I think it's safe to say Auburn's not going to Hoover. I think we all kind of see it for what it is. Ole Miss is tied with LSU and currently in the Hoover Field. Missouri 6-15, and 15, they're only a game back. And so you start thinking, you know, could Missouri find a way to take one of those series and get up there and, and make up some ground there? Uh, because I think Ole Miss is a team that could, could very much free fall out of this whole thing and miss Hoover. Uh, they'll be they'll be primed to play LSU, but I'm t- I'm taking Auburn over Ole Miss this weekend. I do think it'll be a two games to one type deal. And I think it's going to be a fun weekend uh, for Auburn. But um, you know Auburn's pitching has just been you know so beneath what expectations were. But I think when you also begin to think about the way this whole thing shakes out at home, and then without potentially having Leger in the lineup, I, I think it tends to favor Auburn. Maybe it's just me. Maybe you see it differently. But that's how I see it. That's how I see this thing shaking out. All right, you know my thoughts on the Mississippi State-Alabama um, series. But South Carolina is at Missouri. And South Carolina, again, I don't see them as a team that can get to Omaha. I, I don't. I think they're a team that may win a regional and lose a super. Uh, they're currently ranked 15th in the country. And, and I, to be honest with you, I, I'm just not sold on this team. That said, nine weekends in, you have to admit, maybe perhaps they're better than people expected. They're in Missouri. And Missouri's been tough at home. All things considered, they really have been. Missouri has been one of those teams that's kind of an anomaly. You look up and say, what, you know, what's happening here? You know, how does this continue to kind of break loose for them? You know, of course, they, they swept the series against Florida. But in many respects, that's been an outlier. Can games have been competitive? By and large, they have not been able to pull off SEC wins. But they're 13 and 10 at home and 20 and 26 overall. And uh, you kind of scroll through these SEC home series for them. You know, so they opened up going to Arkansas. All right, well, that's never fun. Well, then Kentucky goes up there, and they get one from Kentucky. They go to Nashville. They get swept. So both road series have been sweeps. They sweep Florida. They go to Athens, Georgia, and they get one. So nice road win for them. They're first in SEC play. And then LSU goes up there and loses the middle game. And so when you begin to run through these things, they go to Knoxville and get swept. But those games were competitive. They get beat 3-2, 3-2. And now South Carolina will come in this weekend. And, um, you know, so – I expect maybe Missouri to get a game, but I think South Carolina takes the series. And, of course, Texas A&M at LSU. It's so hard for me to expect anybody to sweep LSU in Baton Rouge. You know, we had a chance to do it in 21 and couldn't close the deal. We should have. We had the big lead, and Sarantola just kind of choked it away there in the first. But um, this LSU team is so interesting. And, again, I think in many respects it it goes back to the whole thing of, you know, how do you want to manage roster procurement 
you know, do you want to build a roster of high school players that are going to develop and be in your program for a couple of years? Because it's not like football. And the transfer portal hadn't hurt us as much, maybe like even basketball. But this LSU team at home is 21 and 8. 29 and 17 overall. Put a ton of games at home, but they're 7 and 14 in the conference. And uh, it's clear there are some chemistry issues. And what I mean by that, maybe not. Maybe not emotionally or relationship-wise, but it, as far as buying in, you know, and, and I think when you go out and get a bunch of mercenaries, that's kind of what you have to deal with. You know, it's tough to kind of meld that together. But, um, you know, Florida went in there and took two out of three. At the time, Florida was number eight in the country, and it kind of legitimized Florida for a little bit. But I think it also was an indictment on maybe who LSU was. Maybe LSU wasn't as who we thought they'd be. They, then they go to Fayetteville. And they get swept. But, again, those games are 7-4, 4-3, 7-5. And maybe on that Sunday game, Saturday game, excuse me, you remember Tommy White hit the uh, controversial foul ball that many thought was a home run that would have given LSU the lead. Not so they would have held it, but they, uh, they could have got it. Well, then Vanderbilt goes down there and takes two of three in Alex Box. And we know the caliber of this Vanderbilt team. They're a good team. LSU then goes to Tennessee and loses to all three. And they go to Missouri and take two out of three. But they have not protected the home turf as well as you might expect. Uh, Auburn does take game three of that series last weekend. Now, A&M's going in there. But I like A&M to take the series, but I think LSU will probably get one. But, uh, yeah, we, we need to pay attention to every bit of this. And, again, we want the teams that we have played to do well, and we want the teams that we've beaten to do well. You know, so you, you look at – you know, it wouldn't hurt us a bit if LSU won two from A&M, right? That would be a better RPS situation for us. But uh, I'm, I'm excited about the weekend. I'm ready to get to Dirty Noble Field, and it does appear the forecast uh, has improved uh, e- even since we have been recording the show. I've had to pause a couple times and take calls and, and uh, kind of get some fresh air. But, um, yeah, it does appear that hey, we should be good to go for the game. And um, I know many of you are, are kind of keeping an eye on that. And, uh, again, I say that the, the weather app is one of the worst things that ever happened to society because everybody's become an amateur meteorologist. Uh, it's helpful, but uh, I understand we've got real professionals here at Mississippi State. If they, were, if they felt that we couldn't get the game in, they would move it. Only one time in recent memory uh, do I remember that being an issue, and that was Super Bulldog weekend. A lot of that's just the reluctance to move a game up and then compete with uh, the spring game. I know it was disappointing that we didn't get the baseball game in, but – we did win that weekend and uh, swept Auburn. So uh, that's how things look, you know, from a uh, SEC perspective. And I just – I like to get the picks out there, but I, I think our rooting interest, as always, are teams that we've beaten and uh, we're rooting against the teams that are ahead of us that we're yet to play. But uh, these Bulldogs, in many respects, kind of control their own destiny. I mean, mathematically, you could still win the SEC, but we're not going to, right? I mean, it's just – it, you're asking an awful lot. You better go up there and win a series at Arkansas. And not to say that we're not capable of taking that series, especially with their anemic offense. But based on recent events and recent memory of our nightmarish trips to Bomb Stadium, I don't see how anybody can expect us to go up there and win that series. Uh, I just don't. I, I don't see it that way. Maybe you see it differently. But uh, I, I've learned the hard way, you know, about Arkansas. It's a great atmosphere. It's a great program. Dave Van Horn's a great coach. And we're going to have to bring a really good effort when we get up there. But first, first and foremost, we got to take care uh, of the Alabama Crimson Tide this weekend. All right, final segment of the show brought to you by the Stark Vegas Clubhouse. Just Google Stark Vegas Clubhouse. And when you do, their Facebook page will come up. You can peruse the selections and look at the pictures and get more information. And you can see all the great amenities that are available to you when you book that fine establishment for your event, whether it be a work group coming in midweek, or whether it be a weekend when you're coming to watch the Bulldogs play, or you know, maybe football, baseball, basketball, whatever. Or maybe it's a couple's weekend. Maybe it's a guy's weekend, a girl's weekend. Maybe it's a mixed weekend. I don't know. We don't judge. You do what you want. Five minutes away from the Mississippi State campus, now, when you Google, there are going to be some booking options that are available to you. Airbnb, VRBO. However, if you book through the Evolve website, we'll give you a 10% discount. Use promo code BSR10. Great, great place to go. My friends used it here a couple months ago. 
had a great time. There's room for everybody to kind of work together in a communal area and then kind of retreat to your, uh, your own bedroom quarters at night. How cool is that? Full service kitchen, so you can go to one of our local grocery stores and stock up and cook all weekend. They put steaks on the grill. I don't know your needs. Also, a wet bar. You want to do some uh, adult beverage intake, you can do that as well. It's a fantastic facility. It might be exactly what you're looking for. Yeah. Check it out today. The Stark Vegas Clubhouse. All right, let's uh, let's get into some portal stuff. The, the uh, spring transfer portal is now officially closed. And again, reminder, that doesn't mean guys had to make a decision. It just means they had to declare that they were going in. So outgoing transfers from Mississippi State, and there have been some. You know, all, all in all, we had 25 transfers. Now, all those guys are scholarship guys. Some of those guys are walk-ons. But, um, you know, kind of working through it here. Uh, you know, since the enrollment period, you know, there's still a handful of guys out there that uh, that entered back in December that uh, have not declared a decision. And uh, there are a few of those, obviously, that um, may not, you know. But uh, looking at who has gone in for the spring, uh, Caleb Bryant, of course, announced his intentions to go into the portal uh, prior to spring practice even concluding. Uh, just had wasn't a good fit. He's moving on. Wish him the best. Uh, Keegan Crimmins, our punter from Australia, and uh, we spoke extensively about our punting problems last year. Uh, Keelan is now headed to Purdue. Transfers from Mississippi State headed to Purdue. Uh, Justin Robinson was a post-spring decision to go in the portal. And, uh, you know, he was a guy, too. Even you know, in the best of times, you know, it was, you know, it was a question, how would he fit? you know, in this new scheme, trying to run more vertical routes. But um, J. Rob's a great guy. I wish him the best. Mike Wright, of course, a fan favorite, elected to go in the portal. But also, too, Mike's just not a good fit for this scheme. You know, we brought him in kind of as a, uh, as a second quarterback last year to kind of give us some red zone opportunities. And, you know, he did some of those things. Of course, we'll always remember Mike for that fabulous hat and that win at Arkansas last year, uh, one of our few. Uh, but, you know, wish Mike the best. But um, – Probably not going to be a quarterback on the Power 5 level. Zay Alexander from Tupelo. He was a guy who was really high on that high school and uh, disappointed that it didn't work out better. But, you know, kind of the early results, or maybe early evaluations in the spring was that he was going to have a tough time playing here uh, in this scheme. And so, again, wish him the best. Jaden Hobson is a guy that I really, really liked. Of course, we flipped him from Southern Miss, but his video was ridiculous. But it didn't translate here, so now he has moved on. Khalid Moore is another guy that I liked an awful lot and I was kind of surprised he didn't get on the field more the last couple of years. Uh, he's in the portal, and again, wish him the best. Avery Sledge was a guy that we took late. A guy that down from Forest County AHS High School, a tremendous athlete, and uh, was a quarterback there, and we thought, you know, that'd be able to translate over. Uh, that hasn't worked out, though, on the defensive side for us. So uh, he is on the move. Uh, may find him at Southern Miss or South Alabama, and that's probably a level that he can play. Wilkie Denot, of course, a guy that transferred in at Mississippi State back in January, back in the portal. So he had some issues at Auburn, comes to Mississippi State, and just lasts the one semester. Now, we've added uh, added a couple guys, too, and uh, we're still in the mix here for some others. But, um, you know, we have, in recent weeks, have added Diego Brumfield, uh, defensive back from Memphis, and then Davin Booth, running back from Utah State. That happened this week. You know, we had Rashad Amos committed for a while, and then he flipped to Colorado. And uh, I don't know that I would want to go to Colorado. It just seems kind of like a toxic environment up there. I'm a big Deion Sanders fan. Got a Deion Sanders autograph on the wall, as a matter of fact, right here in the office when he played for the Atlanta Braves. But um, it just seems kind of, I don't know, kind of toxic up there at times and maybe not a good situation. But to each their own. And so you say, well, Steve, what does this mean now? Well, as it stands now, we've had 17 incoming transfers, and we're expected to take two more. That's the thing when a lot of people don't keep up. You know, we had a discussion this week on the message boards about a kid that committed a week ago. Want to know why we didn't have anything on it? We had three stories on it. But uh, sometimes people are kind of casual observers to what's really going on. But um, you see everybody going out at once, and then they kind of trickle back in. But as it stands right now, Mississippi State has two scholarships to work with, two. Now, 
we discussed official visitors earlier this week. Uh, we do expect both of those guys uh, uh, to make the trip. Now, what's interesting, too, is earlier today, I got a message uh, from about uh, by Job, the Michigan State edge rusher. We have had a really difficult time identifying a guy that can play at this level uh, in the transfer portal. And uh, he was a guy that was – this morning there was a lot of chatter that he may cancel his visit and go ahead and commit to Kansas. That did not take place. I kind of tracked that over there at the jeanspage.com message boards, uh, shared what we knew, when we knew it, and uh, by the middle of the morning we kind of found out that, no, he did not commit to Kansas. Kansas – did what they could to try to get him to commit on his visit and not take the trip to, to Mississippi State. That visit is going to take place now, barring something unforeseen here. I mean, you never know. There's always last-minute changes. However, uh, we're told that Job is going to be here this weekend and that he plans to take the visit and then make a decision sometime next week. Uh, so it's, you know, it's kind of one of those things, too, when it comes to football portal stuff, you know, if they don't commit on the visit, you typically don't get them. But uh, Jacoby Jackson was a guy that told me when he first got started, I'm going to take all my visits and then decide. And then he visits Mississippi State and doesn't commit, and people kind of panic a little bit because it's not a hard and fast rule, but more times than not, when a guy comes on a visit, they typically commit before they leave. But Jacoby Jackson did commit to Mississippi State uh, following that visit to Texas A&M. And uh, that was big. That was big. So if, if you don't see a commitment from Job this weekend, it doesn't mean that all is lost. And that's one of the reasons that I kind of share that for what it is, because you know, a lot of times we, we, we kind of get our own narrative and we think, well, this is how things will go or should go. And if they don't go that way, it doesn't mean that things are going to completely fall apart. But um, that's kind of how the portal breaks down. Again, the portal now officially closed. So anybody now that it says, hey, I want to transfer, there's no portal to enter until December. I guess late November. But, yeah, we have to get through the season now. So part of that is understood. Now, among the two spots we got left, we absolutely have to have an edge. We do. And then uh, we got some corners we're looking at as well. And so it's kind of a best available. You got to get an edge, and then if you can find a good cover guy or you can find a playmaker on offense, you take those guys. But, again, I think Jeff Levy and the staff done a great job. A great job. Need to finish. We really need an edge. That's the, the most glaring weakness I think we have right now. So Job is like priority one. Uh, he absolutely is. Uh, but, we, yeah, we do plan to fill those. Now, if, if it got into a situation, too, we got – there's a couple guys out there, too, that, um, you know, trying to work their way back and may not, you know, so we'll see what happens. You Don't be surprised if you see somebody go on medical at some point because football is a very physical game. That's it to be understood. But right now we have two spots to work with unless somebody uh, just decides to give up football. And so, but, but your transfer portal outgoing traffic has ended. And so you don't have to worry about this again for about seven months. And uh, used to be we'd have to th deal with it every day. And putting these transfer portal windows in, probably one of the smartest things they've done since they opened the transfer portal. But um, We'll spend some time next week talking about this. And, of course, there's, again, a lot of chatter out there about new proposals about making NIL the responsibility of the universities. And so, in many respects, that eliminates fan donations. I mean, I guess you'd still have the ability to, to donate to the university and some of that money could trickle down through NIL. This is something that we thought would probably come. It's not here yet, but at least now the serious conversations about that are now taking place. Uh, I've seen some numbers upwards of like 21%, 22% of revenue being allocated for NIL uh, for universities. And so, of course, you know, that puts quite an obligation on the school. And so I think in many respects that probably slows down kind of the arms race when it comes to facilities. And you know, you're probably going to have to have private donations to get those things done because you're going to have to pay your players. So it's significant. And uh, I know many of you, of course, uh, have made you know, pledges to the Bulldog Initiative. need to continue to, to honor those. But we may see some changes on the NIL landscape uh, here in the months ahead. I mean, you know, that's one thing we've learned since they opened Pandora's box is things are always changing. But we need a national policy that everybody is on board with that enables the schools to be able to do this. And I, I think with the new TV deal, you can probably figure some of that stuff out. 
uh, but there's going to be revenue sharing in college athletics, which is something that five years ago that just seemed absolutely foreign to all of us. And a lot of people say, well, Steve, it's curtailed some cheating. You know, that's not really the case. I think it's probably helped some because now you've got a legal vehicle in which to do that kind of thing. You know, if you, instead of you going and put money in a slush fund and, you know, there's uh, red Nike backpacks dropped off all over the state of Mississippi. You know, but there's still some dark money out there because, there's, you know, people's egos get involved, you know. But I, I think this, to have institutionalized control over the NIL, I think is, will probably curtail even more of that. Now, you're going to have these deals, too, where they talk about signing contracts. And there's, you know, you, it's not just, hey, give me money. There are things you have to do in order to receive that money. And I think that's a big thing. But, um, yeah, college sports is evolving. It is. And I go back to the very beginning of all this when they first started talking about NIL and then immediate eligibility for transfers. When you paired that together, it kind of created a nightmare situation uh, around the country in multiple sports. Of course, you know, we see it primarily in football and basketball, but I can tell you some of the numbers that I've seen and heard for men's basketball will absolutely curl your toes. I mean, it's absolutely crazy to think about some of the money that's out there. Now, a lot of this money that makes the, the papers is not accurate. And you can talk to the players themselves and they'll tell you that no, it's not, that's not true. I wish I was getting that kind of money. But a lot of that too, people put that stuff out there, I think, because of the fact it's, it's a marketing tool, right? It's a, uh, it's a recruiting tool. It's like, hey, well, this school is willing to pay X amount of dollars for this guy that I need to consider them. And maybe I wasn't considering them before. So I think when all this kind of comes together, you'll have a – Essentially, a collective bargaining agreement. I'm sure there'll be some unionization. I know that that makes a lot of people un- unhappy, but it's probably the best course of action at this point. Um, you know, could have work stoppages and things like that, and that's you know, that, we, we never like that. That's why the adults in the room got to get this thing taken care of. But um, but anyway, that's my thoughts on it. And uh, again, I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about that, but it's something you should be aware of that there there appears to be some sanity on the horizon. And you guess you can kind of pick your poison when it comes to that. But, um, you know, I, you know it, that, that does not mean that we should stop uh, our fundraising. You know, we still got to tread water until things begin to change. And uh, we've got a big golf tournament coming up here in a few months. Uh, I think we're going to do maybe a golf hole sponsorship for that. I think we're considering that. Uh, if you hadn't done so, go to truerest.com. You can learn more about True Rest. And if you're looking – For a Mother's or Father's Day gift, right now you get uh, BOGOs on the uh, gift cards. And so it's it's a two-for-one deal, so it works out to be $45 a piece. You can buy one for yourself and one for your mom, or perhaps one for the mother of your children. You know, give mom a day off. Simple as that. Uh, Listen, True Rest of Starkville, of course, uh, it's a business that uh, my wife and I own. She runs it primarily. And uh, I go up there and help when I can. And uh, I've been really busy around here as of late, too, as you guys know. Um, you know, working on the dude. And uh, we're, we're kind of in, you know, it's month of May. And that was my goal to have this book roughed out by the end of May. I guess I got about seven chapters left, something like that. So we got to rough out about two a week. Of course, I've done some extensive research, got a lot of facts together. Now it's just kind of composing the story itself. And then we'll spend the month of June you know, kind of doing edits and rewrites and things of that nature. And then uh, we'll push this bad boy off to get uh, to get printed. And so we hope to have it, you know, around, on or around September 1st. You know, we like to have it for the first ball game. You know, we may get it in August. And uh, it's interesting. People have already reached out about booking me for events and things like that. And, and uh, you, you can do that. If you contact me, I'll direct you to those, those folks. But uh, I've learned an awful lot. And uh, even my agent is like, I, I, this book is so interesting. And he's a Mississippi State guy, too. So he learned a lot. And uh, I can tell you, it's one of the fun things about writing these historical books is because, number one, there's not a lot of information out there about the old days of Mississippi State athletics. And certainly the Duty Noble era, a lot of people know, well, we named the stadium after this guy, but why did we name the stadium after him? I think after you read this book, you're going to understand completely why we did and, uh, you know, Duty Noble gave his athletic and professional career to Mississippi State and uh, was a great Bulldog and fought for the Bulldogs in every aspect. And uh, you're going to read a couple of instances that are going to kind of bring a chuckle to your, to your, to your face because of the fact that um, you're going to read and hear some things that uh, maybe you weren't expecting. But uh, I have been so incredibly fortunate to take this challenge on 
And uh, when it first came out, you know, I kind of committed to it before I even had any research done. I said, you know, this is what we'll have to do. And uh, I'm the kind of person, if I tell you I'm going to do something, I have to do it. I, I ha- I'm committed at that point. So the dude will be out here in a few months. And uh, I- I'll tell you, every one of these books are like my babies. I mean, they really are. Because, you know, it's like you turn them out to the wild, and then all of a sudden, you know, the world can be a cruel thing, right? And um, it's been it's been difficult at times to say, okay, I'm, I'm done. Okay, I approve that this is the final manuscript, we're done, and then you move on, and then you hold your printed words in your hand for the very first time, and you feel exceptionally vulnerable. But uh, this one may be a little more difficult to turn loose of, uh, to be honest with you, because I've had so much fun doing all this research and compiling all this for you guys. Um, and I know the book is good. Uh, let me just go ahead and acknowledge that. That's not me being narcissistic. But uh, I, I know that these the quality of these stories are, are, are good. Uh, and so I think it's a book that you're going to cherish. And it's a book that every bulldog is going to want to have because it really kind of chronicles a time that most people don't know much about. And a lot of this information wasn't available until recent years. Uh, so you got to kind of know how to do the research and kind of find these things for yourself. Uh, we don't have a, re- a date yet for pre-orders, but I will let you know as we get closer to that. Many of you ask me uh, almost daily, when can we pre-order? Uh, and so I'll let you know once I know. But uh, this is a book that, um, again, as some people at Mississippi State told me, this book probably should have been written 50 years ago. and uh, But it wasn't. And now here we are. And I'm, I'm so blessed to be able to really introduce Duty Noble uh, to generations of Mississippi State fans that really don't know much about him as a man or as a person. And I think that's the, the aspect of this that's probably the most important. It's not just a book on Mississippi State history, but a man that helped shape Mississippi State athletic history. And uh, you have grown up as a child or as a student, as a parent, a grandparent, going to Duty Noble Field not knowing much about Duty Noble and why he was worthy of honoring by putting his name on our baseball stadium. And so you're going to learn some things about him. He was a, uh, a very, very good evaluator of talent, especially coaching talent. Uh, he was a great coach, and uh, he was a man that did some amazing things for Mississippi State. And uh, not to be lost in all that, and we'll touch on it later in the book, but his wife Elizabeth, you know, she was, uh, she was a big part of things too uh, here at Mississippi State. And they, didn't, they never had children. And uh, it's interesting to kind of go back and think about, you know, what, why aren't there more nobles connected? But uh, there, there are some out there, and they're all huge Mississippi State fans that just kind of cheer from afar. And uh, they love Mississippi State, and they love everything that's, that's happened, and they love Duty Noble Field. And so I share that with you just because of the fact that I've had a lot of my questions answered. And uh, it's just now just kind of compiling the last little bit. And again, I've been down uh, kind of underneath the weather a little bit, under the weather is the proper term, uh, this week. And so... I've tried to rest when I hadn't had to do stuff for Gene's page, but um, we'll work on the book some this weekend and uh, on in the next week. As I am on the downside of this thing, I probably sound a little raspy, but I do feel better. I don't sound better, but I feel better. You can get uh, all of my sports titles in my latest book at whenthebottomfalls.com. When the Bottom Falls, of course, it really kind of chronicles my life, my path to recovery, and kind of, you know, kind of what it's taken you know, to uh, stay clean and sober now over 32 years. And uh, even if you're not a person that struggles with substance abuse or you have somebody in your life that, that does, uh, I think it's a book worthy of, uh, of your reading. Uh, I, chapter 19 is one of the things I'm most proud of I've ever written. But you need to read the first 18 chapters to truly appreciate 19. And uh, even Duty Noble's niece had messaged one day and she said, whenever I get down or discouraged, I'm going to go back and read chapter 19. I wanted this book to be a book of encouragement, a book of redemption, and a book about overcoming and uh, it's one of the joys of my life to be able to share that with you. But, um, yeah, the dude's a much different book. We're kind of getting back into Mississippi State sports uh, genre, and we got plans for the next one, you know. And uh, I'll need to take a little time off. I always say that, and then I'm always so eager to go again. But uh, I don't know how long all this is going to last, and so I'm just trying to make as, um, you know, make as big an impact as I possibly can. Uh, that's, that's my attitude about it, and uh, I appreciate your support, all of you that have bought books for your friends, your neighbors, or for yourself, uh, whether they be gifts or just you know keepsakes and things of that nature. I, it means a lot to me. And come be a part of our familygeanspage.com, get on the message boards, get your questions answered, and uh, join in the discussions uh, on the message boards. We uh, certainly appreciate that. We have a great community there. 
And um, as always, nobody covers Mississippi State like we do. Yeah, we, as a matter of fact, I, I think we're – I know we're the only uh, media entity that has covered um, every baseball game for the last uh, two weeks. The only one in the country. We've covered every baseball game. Went to Memphis, uh, went to Nashville, went to Pearl. And, uh, of course, we'll have a lot of company this weekend. But uh, we cover the team even when a team leaves, leaves town. And that's in, and this year we added even road basketball to it too. So uh, we, we think we do a really good job with it, and, we, and we, we're glad that you do too. So come be a part of that. But let's get out of here today. Until next time, let's all live our lives in a way we make more friends than enemies and people can see a difference in the way we live. <laughs>